Okay, it's day 68, and as you can see, I've deployed two large solar reflector panels that I made out of cardboard and aluminum foil, very cheap materials that anyone can use if they decide to mimic this tactic anywhere in the world. It's very affordable. One thing that's interesting is the morphology of these leaves of the most well-developed plant, which I'm centering on right now, are sort of roundish compared to what they were before. So I get the feeling that the solar reflectors sort of encourage this kind of growth. I think what's going on are these plants are adapting to the light coming from all directions by growing their leaves in a fashion that ends up making them spherical and convex. And that's the most conducive configuration to catching the maximal amount of sunlight from above and around in all directions as opposed to just having a leaf pointed in a particular direction. And this could be in part because I used a lot of solar reflectors. Early on I used the aluminum foil that was a sort of a poor job and a very makeshift uh, solar reflection device but it got the job done to some degree and now I have very effective solar reflection panels so it's hard to imagine that it could have this effect in just one or two days but it seemingly did and now a lot of the newer leaves are nearly round so I did some testing with a solar panel placement configurations and this is one of the more optimal configurations that I came up with. Here's what happens when you have reflector number one and reflector number two. So we're seeing changes in leaf morphology due to the adaptations in these plants um, in response to the light. So in nature you won't have light coming from all directions but I suspect that because I've created this artificial situation where I have these solar reflectors uh, these leaves are responding by growing in all directions which makes them uh, roundish. So regarding this plant that we're centered on now it had the inverted root ball and it's developing a third true leaf and a fourth true leaf at the shoot apical meristem. The third true leaf looks to be the first one that's healthy the first true leaf is the one you see sort of to the right of the center. It has a dead, uh, frayed edge. The second true leaf was also somewhat deformed, but the third true leaf looks to be the first normal one. Regarding this plant or shoot system that I broke off and put into the soil and watered, it's lost all trigger pressure. It just looks like a dead vegetable, basically. I don't think there's any hope for this one. Regarding the two seedlings I disrupted, this is one of them and it looks to be doing fine. It has a little bit of green as you can see. I think the shoot system and the root system have sort of reestablished themselves in this new environment. Regarding this other seedling, it's also erupting from the soil. Okay, it's day 69. As you can see, these plants are doing relatively well. I detect very few problems and I removed the dead plant that was here because um, that was basically dead and it was all shoveled up. So when I pulled up the shoot system that I had transplanted in the soil it had a very uh, juicy stem still and the stem which remains on the root system side here is still doing fine because there's uh, water coming in. So this seedling seems to have recovered its root system. It probably regenerated most of it through uh, stem cells which exist like in animals throughout the plant. And likewise, this one has done the same, and they're both standing upright in the soil, which is a great sign. If you look here and there, you'll see tiny signs of uh, unhealthiness or problems. But I suppose that's due to the double transplant that occurred within the last seven days. This is the first true leaf of the most robust plant. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's a slight yellowness to the edge, uh, particularly on the side that's near the pot. So I don't know if that's particularly bad sign but definitely all these plants were heavily stressed during the transplants and this just could be something that's like a delayed symptom. Regarding this underdeveloped plant that has an inverted root ball that I buried into the soil deeper you know you can kind of see a yellow spot and a little bit of frayed edges uh, for this second true leaf and I think that's the first true leaf that's the edge of it underneath this much larger leaf and with its cotyledons, they sort of have a little bit of uh, yellowing at the edges too. 
So this plant has been under an enormous amount of stress because I moved its root bolt around and I ripped up some roots. So I'm not surprised to see this happen. Regarding watering of these plants, after I transplanted them all into this 15 inch or 37.1 centimeter diameter pot, that's a plant spa, and I'll talk more about that again later. Basically I watered a little bit on the first day, uh, more on the second day, and yet more again um, yesterday night, the third day, so the soil appears dry on the edges because I didn't water that much on those edges. But I did water a lot in the middle, however I didn't see any water drip down into this uh, hole here at the bottom. So what that hole is, is I'm supposed to load that up with water later on and it has these slits that go into the main chamber which contains all this soil so they're separated but eventually during the day even with or without the sun there's going to be water evaporation in that bottom tray and that's supposed to moisturize all this soil and provide just the amount of water these plants need not more not less and that should pretty much take the water variable out of the equation I hope so I don't have to worry about making mistakes with watering because that's one of the most common mistakes people make is they overwater and things die. So I may have watered too much yesterday. So what we're looking at here in the most robust plant is well first of all the development of a fifth true leaf I believe and a sixth one and a bunch of stuff in between that I can't tell what it is yet but uh, this is a tendril. So two other plants in this pot have already developed very developed tendrils that are long and unfolded. So in botany a tendril, a T-E-N-D-R-I-L, uh, plural tendrils, um, this is basically a modified stem, leaf, or petiole. So what you're looking at here would be the stem, this would be the petiole to a leaf. So out of those three structures um, in climbing plants, they can all become uh, tendrils, essentially. By that, I don't mean they can all, like, spontaneously become whatever they want. You know, if it's in the genetic program for a climbing plant, one of these three structures will have been modified to become tendrils, and certain genes will be activated. And in this case, these cells have differentiated into a tendril, so pretty soon it'll become a coil, kind of like the tendrils you see on... Uh, Sometimes it's similar to like what you see in fern heads, you know, but it's going to unfurl and look for something to climb onto. So the fact that different plants have either the stems, petioles, or leaves modified as tendrils means that's sort of a case of convergent evolution. So here's a case of a tendril that unfurled over the last, I would say, 48 to 72 hours. And it's very long, but it hasn't found a substrate yet. You know, in some species like chaparral daughter Cuscata genus you know I have a video on that uh, you should definitely check it out if you're interested in plants at all it's a very cool parasitic plant um, that one has basically tendrils that go all over the place and look for plant substrates to bind onto so it can parasitize them and that one has a detection method based on chemicals that airborne chemicals that other plants give off and thus it knows which directions to unfurl in it, where to grow and latch onto. So like with all the other plant parts, no part goes to waste. Essentially the tendrils are all green because they too have plant cells that contain chloroplasts that have chlorophyll, which gives it the green color. And it's green because the plant is not absorbing the green wavelengths of light. It's just reflecting that back at us while it's absorbing most of everything else. So this is photosynthesizing to generate even that tiny amount of energy. So every surface area, you know, every surface of a plant uh, doesn't go to waste. They're all working to generate more carbohydrates, basically table sugar, through photosynthesis to provide the plants with the energy they need to do everything else. So this part is very interesting. I have footage of a still, you know, my camera on a tripod aimed at this very long tendril and basically this is over the course of 30 minutes at 64 times normal speed 
So every time I looked at it after I was watching TV or cooking dinner or doing something different, you know, it would be in a different position. So I thought I'd get some footage of that. It's very fun to watch. And we just skipped over a few frames because I missed a few minutes. But essentially this is another block of, I think, 15 minutes of footage. So for you're looking at a total of 45 minutes of tendril footage. Okay, it's day 70. As you can see, the soil is slowly drying out, but I think there's still a lot of water trapped in there based on the heavy watering I did in the third day after I did the transplant. So I watered more heavily successively with each day. You know, the first day it was just, you know, a few cups. Then second day, I uh, really inundated this thing. And the third day, you know, I poured probably, I don't know, a liter and a half, I would say, of water in there. So the center is still wet because that's where I did most of the watering. That's the most important part for these plants. And I think the, you know, worries of the leaf edges yellowing are more or less unfounded at this point, you know. I just got a good vibe about these uh, plants. I don't think I'm going to water today. I didn't water yesterday either. So I think I'll wait until tomorrow or the day after to water. I think there's plenty of water left in this soil.